my name is Amanda Murphy. Um, I've been a television producer for over 25 years and sort of learnt that if you stay around long enough in television and arrive in academia, they give you a nice grand title. So now I'm Professor of Creative Industries, uh, probably just because they can't give an older person sort of such a junior title. So no, it, it, I, I had to jump through hoops, but, but anyway, it's a great title to have. Uh, and I'm in the, I work in the Research Innovation Unit of Story Futures at Royal Holloway. So I'm talking more from the sort of practice side um, you know, and, and what we do in, in the kind of innovation uh, with, with research and innovation projects. Um, I'm going to be talking about, as, as, as uh, I was introduced, about uh, democratising access to immersive technologies like VR, AR and virtual production, and how education, I believe, can be refreshed by technology. I know it's the dog wagging the tail, but let's see if it, if, does, it does it wag it well. Um, so I just want to start by confessing that I knew almost nothing about these technologies about six years ago. I actually joined the university um, on a project they pulled me in to do, which was all about old analog television and about getting crews back together with the kit they used to work with and getting them reusing it to sort of look at analog processes and also kind of haptic muscle memory as a man and machine. And so in a way, that was, sort of, that was from the technology from the 60s and 70s. So we're now actually talking about 67 years of technology, 60 to 70 years of technology, so a very long period. Um, I want to talk a bit about, um, oh, excuse me one second. So, so, so yeah, so I'd, I'd like to share some of the ways that we at Royal Holloway University have been navigating the many challenges and barriers that get in the way of this tech landing in the, in the hands of tutors and students right across educational institutes. So they can benefit not just from more situated and experiential learning, but from developing critical skills in the creative use of immersive tech, now essential in almost every field of work. So in case you're wondering what the relevance of this rather strange image is, uh, we at Royal Holloway University um, did a project called Story Trails in 2022. And this is the cast of Funny Girls, a drag show, uh, drag, drag show in Blackpool, which is one of the most deprived towns in the UK. And here they are enjoying an augmented reality history tour uh, on the road in, in that period. And our mission was to get this tech into the hands of diverse creatives who typically don't get access to this sort of technology. And I'll be using that as a case study, um, walking, uh, moving through in a second. But first of all, I want to go back to, to just rewind a wee bit to 2018, when we set up Story Futures. So Story Futures uh, is funded by the UK government. It's the uh, research and innovation arm of the government, U the UKRI. Uh, and we were funded really to guide these new t uh, immersive, uh, innovative technologies into the mainstream and to skill up the nation. We had the grand ambition of the UK being the sort of world leader. Uh, whether or not is another question. Um, but our approach was to build strong partnerships with the creative industry and not just sort of with SMEs, but actually really joining with the big players. So people like Meta and Epic Games, for example, and to co-design research and development programs with them so we could learn how to tackle the challenges of these new technologies together. Uh, it's all about people, 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 as Peter said earlier. Um, but they, they brought real-world experience of, of games, theatre, film and TV, and we brought the brains of colleagues from right across computer science, engineering, psychology, performing and digital arts. So did we know what we were doing? Not really. I'd be lying. Uh, we were making it all up as we went along together. Um, so what emerged over a five-year period were, first of all, lots of skills reports. Uh, we needed to understand where the skills gaps were and to how we could future-proof uh, our students and next generation. So we did the first ever report on skills for immersive experience creation, built a series of innovative training programs uh, and quite a lot of demonstrator and accelerator projects. But for the sake of time uh, here today, I'll just share one uh, example of, of an accelerator project that exemplifies the power of collaboration between industry and academia. So this is the National Gallery's project called Virtual Veronese. And uh, the National Gallery wanted to, uh, were keen to explore whether they could attract wider and new audiences, particularly young audiences, uh, and whether by using new technologies they could get people to engage and interact with art more. So how could they use it in a storytelling sort of fashion? So we ran a sort of competitive sandpit-like story lab. We ran a lot of these actually through, through the five-year period, bringing together our multidisciplinary teams uh, of researchers and academics now out of their silos working together to help SMEs working in the immersive space who came in and competitively pitched for the work. And they all came up with different creative visions and technical kind of tech specs for it. And the strongest a company, for those in here around uh, from the UK, a company called Focal, um, Focal Point, won the pitch. Uh, and we match funded it for, and, and made a first of its kind prototype for the gallery. 
So the gallery selected one piece of art. It was the, a piece, uh, a 16th century uh, Italian piece called The Consecration of St. Nicholas by Veronese. Uh, and we worked with the winning team to create, they created a 3D model of the chapel where the art was originally set. It was this wonderful old uh, monastery, or part of the monastery in San Benedetto de, de Al Po in Italy. And they brought the abbot and St. Nicholas to life in 3D. For those wanting a bit more tech, it was, they used real-time models, volumetric video, and, and Unity game engine. Um, and so the, through VR headsets, and in fact there's an AR app as well, uh, visitors were transported back to the 16th century, back to Italy or to Italy, where they could meet these characters and learn the story behind the paintings. So that was 2019, um, and with queues at the door, the National Gallery considered it a great success. And luckily, all of this obviously was documented as a research project, and our psychology teams managed to evidence the kind of impact with a lot of qualitative and quantitative uh, surveys and, and audience, um, uh, audience uh, data. So for the, for the, for the National Gallery, um, it, for, the, sorry, for the National Gallery, it actually meant they really started moving forward by using this tech in... Uh, they're now developing, in fact, using it, they've now got a full digital gallery. But they first developed and uh, moved on to an AR app called um, The Keeper of Paintings. So they were just trying to work out if they could gamify kind of art for kids. They wanted to keep kids in galleries, first obviously to engage with art, uh, number one, but also they wanted to keep the kids in the galleries so that the families stayed longer and spent more money in the cafe and bookshop. Um, so what they did is they did a little gamified, you know, you had to sort of go, the kids had to go and find clues and uh, became the keeper of, of the art and kind of pieced it all together. A very exciting, fun piece. Um, but, um, sorry, this is my train of thought for a very quick second. <laughs> the bad bit of having paper. Um, right, so... It, yeah, it's important, all this research, as I said, with end, the end-to-end -end research, actually we use all the way through uh, as case studies and shared with our students and across courses and various kind of um, departments at, in, in our HE actually use this research. So we, we, we shared this all the way through. But clearly, I mean, what's you know, difficult for universities, we all know, is getting, uh, getting all that learning and insight into the curriculum is, is no easy feat. We know that um, universities are anything but agile, unless you're KU and Luton, and you're becoming agile. <laughs> with all sorts of interesting strategies to get there. But getting courses, uh, new courses designed and validated can take an enormous amount of time. Um, and it doesn't help that there's hype cycles and we're all kind of going, oh my good Lord, we know what's the next thing. In one minute it's VR, and next it's virtual production, then it's AR, and now it's clearly AI. So how to keep up? Well, we were determined not to be beaten and, uh, and to give it a go and came up with this rather ambitious program called Train the Trainer. So mirroring a bit what we'd achieved in the creative industries of getting people out of silos, we challenged universities all across the UK to form cross-disciplinary teams. So they had to have at least four people from different, different departments. They had to bring in at least one industry partner and identify an immersive focus challenge that needed to be solved. So it meant that they could come with an AI, AR, XR, uh, sorry, uh, VP, VR problem, so we could actually cover a range of challenges across the spectrum. Importantly, they had to get senior management buy-in uh, and commit to converting the learning into new or modified immersive courses for their HEI. So it was a pretty big ask, and I kind of hid under my desk thinking no one would apply, but actually 35 teams applied. And uh, in the end, we funded 19 higher education institutes, so all came together, importantly in cohort learning. So this cross-campus learning, we created a program whereby they all came together, they sort of did that Rather than that arm over your research, they opened, opened it up, shared it with each other. Um, and what we, um, what we managed to form in the end was a, a really big, uh, in the UK, immersive focused academic community and knowledge share at scale. So just, um, there are many, many examples. Uh, we, we managed to train uh, 172 academics. Uh, they created 62 new or modified courses and built capacity to train uh, over 3,000 students per year. That was sort of between 21, 20, 20 and 21. So I'm just going to share one outstanding example here, uh, the University of Greenwich, who are focusing on virtual production pipe uh, workflows. 
There were two other universities, so Abate and the University of Surrey, were also focusing on different aspects of virtual production, and the three, the three university teams really did work together to help each other. But what Greenwich did was quite unique. They got all their heads of departments, so the head of film and television production, the head of drama, the head of games, and the head of computer science, to all train themselves in every single role of virtual production. They had a green screen version of a, of a, of a, of a wall. Uh, and they all worked through all the roles, so they could really kind of uh, trickle that knowledge down to their departments. And they also formalised their industry relationship with the acclaimed virtual production company Final Pixel. Uh, and now together they're running some of the UK's best virtual production courses, so they've also commercialised it. So on to the project called Story Trails, which I mentioned at the top in 2022, uh, which we won funding uh, to create what became, as I said, the largest immersive storytelling project in the future, in the future, in the UK. Uh, it was funded by, I wasn't going to mention this, Unboxed, because lots of people thought it was going to be a Brexit festival, and it luckily wasn't a Brexit festival, but we've dumped the word Unboxed quite quickly. Um, I'll play you a clip, though, because it's quite an unusual project, so you can see what it's about. Story Trails is the UK's largest immersive storytelling project. We are inviting people to turn up to their local library. They can have an immersive cinema experience, emotional maps of the place where you live. They can try VR experiences made from the BFI archives, or they can go on an augmented reality trail. You wouldn't believe that you could stand there and watch this film footage from you know 80 years ago in this place. Remember, it's your town. The story trails idea is something that I care about because it is about reminding ourselves that those places are not just special to us, but they're special to our ancestors. They'll feel, I think, very proud of their city after doing the trail. This is a story that they wouldn't have been able to experience in a different way, in a different setting. It really is like nothing that I've experienced before. Truly immersive use of archive. It's so incredibly exciting. There you have it. That was it's one of probably the most ambitious projects we, we took on, um, and it was a project that we really wanted to use to democratise access to immersive technology in a way that was never done before. So working with those seven different partners, and possibly the best known public historian David Olashoga, who inspired us with his interest in forgotten people and forgotten histories to revisit histories in in a very new way. So we wondered what would happen if you put this technology in the hands of diverse, creative and local people, so they could give rise to and amplify different voices. The new creatives, of course, the 50 that we did manage to recruit during lockdown, here they are, needed to be trained, and here they are training, learning this new world of place-based storytelling, ironically, from within the four walls of their bedrooms. Uh, reference to what Sonia was saying, what did we learn from COVID? A lot. <laughs> um, so we had to... Um, we had to train them really in how to unearth hidden histories, moving from good old fashioned paper to a range of software we taught them, such as mirror boards, uh, to help them map out their stories. So for example, half of the creatives worked on what we were, uh, these walking AR trails, augmented reality walking trails, using a set of principles and story arcs and templates we provided. So this was part of a toolkit uh, that we've created, we've now made available to all our students. Uh, it's much more intensive than that. Fundamentally for the, Trail makers, they were mapping out narratives that could unravel over six stops, starting and ending at the library. There was a lot more involved in them understanding how to turn sort of stories into short form story forms with cliffhangers and writing for interaction for the audience journey, scripting differently, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The other half, uh, the creators, were making what we called the emotional maps, but basically we call them psychogeography maps of their towns because they were gathering stories of rootedness and people's connections to their towns, and they were using a combination of scans an audio, audio testimony. So what they did is we, we, we sent them all uh, lots of kit in the post. So they got smartphones in the post and Zoom recorders for audio. Um, and the map makers used uh, an app called Scaniverse. So Scaniverse is a literally it's free app, so nice open source, um, which meant they could scan people, they could scan objects, and they could scan places. 
And they taught, they, we taught them how to, modularly, uh, to, how to build modularly uh, so they could create whole environments bit by bit. We've talked a bit about modular education. We did the same thing with teaching them how to create this sort of, the, 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 these, these pieces. So ways of representing people and stories of their towns differently, building them up. And here's a tiny flavor from Blackpool. It's a very specific aesthetic. This, this obviously scanning is, uh, look is not for everyone, but it's a really simple way that ordinary folks can make up something really quite interesting. Blackpool Tower really is the central focal point of all entertainment here in Blackpool and you know some could say for the whole of the Northwest it really is I would say the beating heart of the resort you know when you you we come to the start of our season it really is magical you see we all say it here at the tower we feel the tower coming to life again when we start having our visitors coming in to see the circus and the ballrooms open you know it's a special place for a lot of people as well we have ballroom dancers that may come five times a week and you know and this is their social life and they have their friends in the ballroom we also have people that come to the, see the circus numerous times a week as well so you know for a lot of people it means a lot to the people of Blackpool but also I'm going to pause it there because there's obviously it goes on quite long that clip just to give you a little flavour of the very quirky quirky piece um, and in fact I should just, to just say that the creatives who made that bit of work actually did all the scanning did all the modular build and then we had a partner called ISO Design who came in and added a little bit of 3, a 4D cinema flair to kind of bring that animation and kind of final look what was really important for all of our creators was, was a kit of parts, giving them a kit of parts so they could actually sort of plug and place some of the, some of, some of the content. And, and the way we brought a lot of that from industry and I brought a lot of that from some of the work that I'd done in the past uh, with training and working with people on, on big series that were format series like Big Brothers and Super Nannies and those kinds of series. Um, so the kit of parts, uh, it, was, it was really important for them to have a range of things like, so for example, for the trails, they had portals so that people, so visitors could step back in time. Uh, old televisions and radiograms, I knew I could get my old technology back in there somewhere. Uh, so they could decide uh, whether they wanted to play archive, for example, in a sort of more time appropriate sort of way. Um, and this app, it was an app on a smartphone built by Niantic, so they were one of our partners, and Niantic made the very famous Pokemon Go, which I'm sure you'll, you'll all know about because no one's made anything as good as Pokemon Go since. Um, and then the, 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 the creators had to learn uh, lots of other software when they were making the trail, so two bits of software, one was called Descript and one was called Reality Composer, and Descript is a bit of software whereby they could actually they could lay out the choreography of their scene, uh, so they could work out kind of the route through, if you like, like a little tiny theatre scene for, for the visitor, and Reality Composer, which I don't have an image of, but that meant they could spatialise their story, it was all very new to them. Uh, this is them choosing between uh, either 1960s tellies or they could use projectors. So they could play around with scale, for example. And they had archive courtesy of our two fantastic partners, the BBC and BFI, so they had access to all of the UK's wonderful archive treasures and lots of regional archive and home archive, which we encourage them to, to, to go and find, obviously unearthing different stories. So they, had, you know, they could play with these really, really exciting little bits of kits of parts within the app. Let me refine myself on my lovely bits of paper. Uh, excuse me a second. Yeah, so, so these, these are some of the scenes that they created. So uh, in, in the app, they, as, as I showed you earlier, they, they were creating six different stops, six different scenes. And the scenes would do things like, so they could create a lot of major characters. There's an imp, uh, he's, he's a gargoyle, he's a symbol from Lincoln. Uh, there were scenes like, for example, we were trying to debunk the myth of Sheffield being a smoky steel town. So here's the green belt recreated outside the town hall where it was formed by a very famous woman called Ethel Haythelmthwaite. I love saying her name because people don't know who she was. Uh, and the scene in the middle, which was basically about uh, side, freaky sideshows from the 1930s, which was part of queer history of Blackpool. So they were able to tell these stories in really exciting ways and take people inside scenes so they could experience history where it happened. Oops. And here is a little bit of what actually it looks like in the app. So obviously with the, with, with the, um, the trails, you experience them. You could do the tabletop versions and also experience them in situ. And this is just a bit of a recording from the tabletop version. Hello. I'm calling about your application to be a roadie. Well, congratulations. You've got the job. Come join me, Robbie G, as a roadie doing the Lambeth Honky Tonk Walk. Your artist, Winifred Atwell. Your mission, to help her become the first UK black artist to top the charts. 
for filmmakers, and that's Robbie G from Snatch. And we had lots of famous people come and do the voices with us. Uh, you know, we had um, Patsy from from Absolute, uh, from Ab, Ab Fab come and do one in Dundee. So, so lots of great names stepped forward and wanted to be part of this for free. Um, Important to end-to-end -to -end inclusion was our library partner. So that was quite an unusual partnership through the Reading Agency. Uh, and we had 15 libraries in towns and cities across the UK, first connecting our creatives to community stories uh, and giving our creatives a place to base themselves and to connect to each other when they were doing this work. But they also acted as cultural destinations for showcasing our story trails on tour. So we had a van we parked, you can see the tail end of it sticking out there on the middle picture, uh, and all of the other stuff was showcased within the libraries. That, and, and as I said, the, the walking trails started and ended at the libraries. So it was, they were a bit like the nation's virtual living room. And 1.3 million people engaged with the project during that year, that summer, almost half having never used this tech before. And importantly, 909, I say that specifically because we're proud of it, librarians uh, were trained in the use of this technology. And they're still using it. We left them with the kit. They're still using it and running workshops in their communities. So an incredible way to get the work out there. Uh, there was a bit of a happy accident, uh, which was a thing called Big Me, Little Me. Uh, so basically, we left some tablets and phones and things around the library, and we started letting the public actually play around with scanning themselves. And it was partly to show them a little bit, to give a bit of kind of insider info on how we made the, the, the emotional maps, how were these modern things made up. And partly it was great for them to walk away with a photograph of themselves, their real self, holding their digital self in their hand as a little, little sort of mem memorandum from the, from the project. So... That actually really started to inform how we're working on with the project, with Story Trails 2.0, which we're developing, about how can we actually de develop it using much more participatory sort of storytelling models and using AI, which I'll go on to in a second. Um, but making sure, one thing we, we feel is really important is making sure everyone's in the ring. So I think this is reinforcing the point that Peter said earlier on. Uh, and that actually, I love that picture because that's actually from one of our stories in Dundee and it's Dick McTaggart, a famous boxer, and all of his brothers. Ah, I just quite like the image. Um, so making sure everyone's in the ring. So it's everyone from, from the academics uh, that I mentioned, researchers, academics from lots of different departments. Uh, the seven different industry partners are going big on, on, on partnerships, are bringing different skills, but involving the students. So the students actually were part of this project. PhD students um, specialising in media inclusion, MA public history students researching the histories, uh, and media arts students onboarding and offboarding the public. So we were all learned to, 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 to do this on the fly, the creative industry way, but learner empowerment was a big part of it. And it made us think differently about the way our university does things, about our willingness to take on and teach what you don't quite know. It helped us build practice inclusion, uh, in inclusive innovation frameworks, which we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time on now. We're working on a new center for doctoral training, for example, with Surrey University that's using AI to actually change, be a bit game-changing around media inclusion and to, to stop a sort of one-size-fits-all media. That's a new bit of work we're, we're doing, which I'll happily talk to people about separately. Hello, um, folks. Oops, one Let's go backwards. And then this, this is, so we're prototyping the story trials too, trying to think of simple ways that ordinary people and students could make things using AI. So this is, you can take a photograph in black and white, you can, through a small app, colorize it, and animate it. So this is Winifred Atwell. She's the first uh, black musician uh, in the UK to get a number one hit. And with a photograph, you can very simply, in about 20 seconds, uh, colorize her and add her own. Hello, folks, welcome and welcome audience. to the first of our piano parties. I'm sure, I'm you, sure will you will agree that my old piano, piano certainly gets, gets things swinging. swinging. So we'll so start, start right, right off with one of my party, party medleys. Lots of ethical questions around what you do and do do with that, though. So we can we can have a conversation about that later, I'm sure. So just a quick uh, wrap up. Um, this is just a lovely photograph of us all winning some awards, just because it's great to get a slap on the back when you've worked really hard on projects. So we won the Museum and Heritage Award and Focal uh, Award for our use of archive. And really, just to say, uh, to wrap up, to say it, it's kind of really important to in these in these you know with these technologies to actually. Think big, be audacious, collaborate, 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 and um, not be afraid to, do, to, to not do something you don't know yet. So here's a little picture of me. Uh, this is me. I used to be called Mandy Marie Mary Murphy from Shawbury in Shrewsbury in Shropshire. Bit of a mouthful as a four-year-old kid. And just saying that because I would have been one of those kids in the library queuing up to have a go at this because we had this, you know, we, uh, where I live in Shawbury, no one knew about this, this sort of stuff and I didn't have that kind of background. So it, I'm really passionate about actually the way we democratise and get these technologies and make sure they're available for everyone. It's a big passion of mine. So I just want to say thank you very, very much and looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.